and welcome to the amazing journey of Leonard Case and the execution of Captain Jack presented by Jackson County Library Services and the Southern Oregon Historical Society. I'm Carrie Tannehill, Head of Adult Services. This program is being recorded. Please mute your microphone and turn off your camera if you um, so choose to ensure a quality recording. The recording of today's program will be uploaded to the JC List Beyond YouTube channel within two weeks. There will be a time to answer your questions at the end of this program. Please put them in the chat box and um, Todd will address them at the end of his presentation. Um, the views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. Today's presenter is Todd Keppel. He's been the manager of the Klamath County Museum for the past 16 years, and he served seven years on the Oregon Heritage Commission. Thank you, Todd, for being with us today, and I will give it over to you to present. Super. Thanks, Gary. It's good to be with you. I'm uh, very glad to uh, get the invitation to share some history from um, the side of the mountains here. And uh, the topic that uh, I offered to present on and which was accepted was uh, some new information we've learned about the Modoc War uh, just within the past decade or so. The Modoc Indian War is probably one of our top stories in Klamath history that we consider to be of national significance. Of course, more recently, our water issues uh, have become nationally significant. Uh, for a while this summer, we had the nation's largest wildfire burning here. We had uh, more than 400,000 acres of timberland in the Klamath Basin and a little bit of spillover into uh, the Goose Lake Basin in Lake County. Uh, so we were in the spotlight a lot this summer. I know I personally got interviewed by a number of international media reporters um, about uh, either the water issues or the forest fires. And so it's been an interesting summer. But uh, looking at the big picture when it comes to Klamath Basin history, it's the Modoc Indian War that uh, really put uh, Klamath on the map and in the news back in the 19th century. Um, the Modoc Indian War um, is often considered to be one of the most important Indian wars in American history for the impact that it had on America's peace policy and uh, policies for dealing with Native American tribes. It's not a happy story. Uh, there are no heroes and there are no clear villains uh, in the Modoc War story. It's, it's a very complicated story. The main war itself uh, dragged on for uh, several months, uh, starting with the opening battle in late November of 1872, and then it was uh, June of 1873 before the last of the Modocs were rounded up by the United States Army. Uh, then there was a trial, which I'll be talking about today, <clears throat> and then finally the execution of four Modocs on October 3rd, 1873. And uh, of course, there were repercussions that carried on for years after that, and uh, there were uh, numerous conflicts between white settlers and Modocs in the years leading up to uh, the actual open, uh, what we refer to as the Modoc War. So it's a long and complicated story, and I don't want to try to tell the whole thing. I'm sure many of you have probably done some reading about it. There have been a number of books published about the Modoc War over the last uh, 60 or 70 years, and there continues to be research done on it. And uh, here in uh, Klamath, we're actually starting to talk about uh, recognizing the 150th anniversary of the war coming up in a couple of years. So uh, what I'm going to do is give a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, about some of the new information that's come to light in the last um, a decade or so, uh, particularly with some artifacts uh, that we um, obtained here at the Klamath County Museum. I'm going to start my uh, screen share now. Uh, I've titled the program Captain Jack and the Millionaire uh, Tourist. Uh, really what the gist of my presentation is about today is about this gentleman that's seen here in the lower left a part of the screen um, here. Um, his name was Leonard Case. And this was a fellow that we had never heard of until about 10 years ago. And it uh, comes to find out that he was present for the execution of the Modocs in 1873. He actually traveled uh, about two thirds of the way across the country uh, just to be present at the execution of the Modocs. Um, some of you may have visited this site here. I'd be curious to know how many of you have been to the spot at the Fort Klamath Museum. It's about halfway between Klamath Falls and, um, and Crater Lake. It's a few miles south of the south entrance to Crater Lake. 
most of the visitors that we get at the Fort Klamath Museum are actually tourists that are just headed to Crater Lake, and many of them have never really heard of Klamath before. Uh, many of them have never heard of the Modoc uh, Indian War before. They've never heard of the Modoc people. They're just on their way to Crater Lake, and they come from all over the world, and they're driving up Highway 62, and uh, they see a sign that says museum. And um, for every 100 people that drive by, there's a certain percentage of them that will stop for museums. And I bet many of you are uh, that sort of a person yourself. And so uh, we, we get a lot of visitors at our Fort Klamath Museum every year. Um, it's only open during the summer months, basically from Memorial Day through September. But when it's open, it is the busiest museum that we have in our uh, museum system here in uh, Klamath County. Uh, so uh, if anybody would like to share comments in the chat, uh, I would love to uh, see what comments some of you may have about visits that you've made uh, to the Fort Klamath Museum. So um, really what we're talking about today is an individual who in 1873 made the trip from Cleveland, Ohio to visit this spot uh, here in Southern Oregon where uh, these Modoc graves are. Um, of course, they weren't graves at the time he was here. He came to witness the execution and then, um, and then he headed back home to Cleveland. So this uh, incident that is depicted in this artist's rendering from 1873 uh, shows the incident, it illustrates the incident that occurred that led to the execution of four Modocs. And in this picture, I'm going to try to use my highlighter here to point out uh, the depiction of Captain Jack. Uh, Kent Prash was his Modoc name. Um, white people, of course, had troubles pronouncing many uh, names of the first peoples in their uh, traditional uh, Aboriginal language. And so most white people referred to him as uh, as Captain Jack. And uh, this picture here done actually for the Illustrated News of uh, London shows him firing his gun on General Canby here. Uh, so this was uh, the incident that lay, led to the conviction of six Modoc uh, leaders um, and for them to stand trial in 1873 for the murder of General Canby as well as a Methodist minister uh, who was present uh, for this this meeting that took place, Reverend Thomas, uh, those were the two uh, the two gentlemen on uh, the government side, members of the Peace Commission who had met with Captain Jack uh, to try to bring about an end to the hostilities. And it was during that meeting of the Peace Commission with the Modocs uh, that Captain Jack and other Modocs uh, pulled out weapons and fired on members of the Peace Commission, killing General Canby uh, that's shown here and uh, Reverend Thomas. So um, what we learned only about uh, actually 11 years ago was that this millionaire uh, resident of Cleveland, Ohio, Leonard Case Jr. Uh, made this trip out to Fort Klamath to witness this execution. And he kept a couple of journals as he made his trip across the country. And he traveled with an assistant uh, Mr. Abbey and the two of these uh, gentlemen traveled by train across the country and kept a day-by-day -day journal of their travels. Uh, we didn't know about this, this, uh, these two journals, three journals altogether, until we came across uh, a fellow by the name of Wes Cowan. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember watching this program on PBS History Detectives. Wes Cowan is one of the um, hosts of the program, and here he is pictured on uh, their website. Wes came to Klamath Falls back in 2010, and he was filming a segment in one of our museums, and I just went to kind of watch what they were doing, and as we were chatting, he said, by the way, you folks may be interested in this item that we have coming up for auction at our auction house in Cincinnati, Ohio, and so he was telling me about it, and Sure enough, we were interested. We had never heard about these diaries that had been kept. And we had to do some pretty quick research to find out, well, who, exactly who is this Wes Cowan and is he truly an authority? And can we trust him that these are genuine artifacts and that they're going to be worth the unknown thousands of dollars that we might have to spend on them? And so, you know, with a little bit of research, we found out that Mr. Cowan does uh, have a, a, a good reputation as a dealer in um in antiques and artifacts uh, from American history. And so we entered the bidding 
And for a mere $20,000, we were able to get these diaries that had been created back in 1873. This picture shows members of our museum board um, on the day that the diaries arrived here in Klamath. And the gentleman seated here in the center uh, handling one of the diaries is uh, the former professor of history at Oregon Institute of Technology, uh, Dr. Mark Clark. Uh, he was uh, as excited as we all were to get these journals that were created uh, nearly 140 years ago, um, detailing the Modoc War. So uh, since we had never heard of Leonard Case Sr. or Jr., we, of course, wanted to find out who this gentleman was that created uh, these journals. And we found out uh, that uh, Leonard Case Jr. had established a school back in Cleveland and made uh, quite a name for himself there. <clears throat> Leonard Case Sr., who's uh, listed here, uh, was a successful businessman who had amassed a fairly good-sized fortune, and his son then inherited that fortune. And <clears throat> they were written up in this, uh, uh, this brochure that we found. And so here's a, a drawing of uh, Leonard Case, uh, the younger, the junior. And so this is uh, the man that we came to learn something uh, about. We found uh, a, uh, an account of his life that he uh, traveled quite a bit. Uh, he traveled uh, to England at one time. He made a trip to Germany, Italy, Switzerland, uh, did some mountain climbing, um, had a race and uh, um, became ill after the race, but then he recovered during the American Civil War. He went on a trip uh, to Knoxville um, just to watch one of the Civil War battles. And then we find uh, this paragraph. In 1873, he made uh, with friends, actually it was one friend, his assistant, a journey to California, to Mount Shasta and the Modoc lava beds, uh, just uh, south of the state line here in the Klamath Basin, and was a guest of the United States Post, that would be Fort Klamath, uh, having in custody and uh, charged with the execution of the Modoc chiefs condemned to be hanged for the murder, murder of General Canby and others under a flag of truce. So even though we had never heard of Mr. Case, we were greatly relieved to hear that there was um, uh, ample evidence that this uh, gentleman had made the trip and had kept these journals. Uh, we continued our research and found uh, further evidence regarding the journals. We eventually uh, happened upon um, a report uh, that was that showed up eventually in the records of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, oh, let's see, I forgot I added this photo into my program. Uh, this photo showing uh, uh, Mr. Case and Mr. Abbey, his assistant uh, that traveled with him. Uh, Mr. Case uh, then eventually went on to establish uh, a university, which still is in existence in uh, Ohio. It's known as Case Western Reserve University now. Um, right. All right, so here's that report from the Smithsonian Institution. In 1922, this would be nearly 50 years after, after the Modoc Indian War, some materials were submitted uh, to the Smithsonian Institution, and in their inventory, they list some materials that were donated by a Miss Julia Abbey of New York City. And so our interest there was in that <clears throat> particular entry in their accessions. And it notes here that Miss uh, Julia Abbey of New York City had uh, donated to the Smithsonian a basket from the Modoc Indians of 1873 and three scrapbooks, uh, two made by Henry Abbey and one uh, by Leonard Case of Cleveland, Ohio. They're referred to here as scrapbooks, but uh, they are actually just day-by-day -day journals of the of the journey that these two men made across the country. So uh, what I'd like to do is um, I've kind of taken some of the highlights from uh, Mr. Uh, Case's uh, journal, as well as Mr. Abbey's journals. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll show you some photos uh, or you know, scans of the pages from that journal and kind of give you an outline of the trip. So um, an overview of their trip includes these dates in 1873, uh, when in the middle of July, um, they departed Cleveland. Uh, you know, I might just pause here to make the observation. Uh, and in fact, I think I'll stop my screen share here for a second, uh, just to um, take a little break. 
this this whole story we found really fascinating about this man who traveled from Cleveland, Ohio, across the country to come to Southern Oregon uh, to witness this execution of the Modocs. Uh, this was a gentleman that had been to uh, travel to England and had witnessed battles in the Civil War and uh, had inherited a fortune from his father. And what do you suppose? He must have been sitting around one day and said to his assistant, you know, I think I'd like to go out west and see some Indians be hanged. Uh, I suppose there must have been a time when he sat and as was thinking about that and made this decision to make this travel, uh, this journey across the country. Uh, it's pretty, I don't know, I just think it's pretty fascinating to uh, think about. So here's, uh, here's the timeline. He left uh, his home in Cleveland on uh, the 23rd of July in 1873, um, traveled by train. Uh, through Kansas and made it to Denver and then continued on to Cheyenne, Ogden, Utah, and eventually arriving in San Francisco, September 17th. So this was a journey of about six months, but notice here, he got to Denver on July 27th and then didn't continue on to uh, Wyoming until the 14th of September in 1873. So what happened during that six, six weeks there? Well, it turns out he decided to go on a hunting trip and he hired uh, one of the most famous uh, local hunting guides. Uh, it's not a name that meant anything to us and I can't recall the gentleman's name now, but they went on a hunting trip of, uh, as I recall, uh, three or four weeks in Colorado. And uh, during this hunting trip, they encountered Indians. They got chased, uh, chased off by Indians at one point. They got rained on uh, during thunderstorms. Uh, None of that really matters except to think about how these journals that were kept by Mr. Case and Mr. Abbey, these journals went through all of that. They kept these journals dry somehow and carried them with them on this journey across the country. Uh, at any rate, uh, let's get back to our trip uh, to Fort Klamath here. Um, they spent a week in San Francisco uh, gathering up supplies and preparing for their trip north uh, to Fort Klamath. Um, in those days, the railroad, of course, had, the Transcontinental Railroad was in service, and uh, the railroad uh, north out of Sacramento had reached Redding, but that was the end of the line in 1873. Um, they um, departed Fort Klamath uh, on the day of the execution, and they arrived back in San Francisco about three weeks later. So what I'd like to do is show you a few of the key pages from the uh, several hundred pages that are in these, these journals. They're just small little books. The handwriting was quite good and we're able to read pretty well all of the writing that they left. Uh, so here's the account of uh, Mr. Case um, leaving Cleveland, uh, 6.45 in the morning, they boarded the train. I got to Indianapolis about 8 p.m. Uh, after a late breakfast, uh, oh, now um, we're going to just jump ahead to San Francisco, uh, September 21st. Now they're on the West Coast. Uh, they had a late breakfast. They went to the Market Street Pier uh, to see the harbor like any tourist would do uh, today, uh, I suppose. Uh, the pier was strewn with the damaged cargo of the steamer Costa Rica, which had wrecked uh, the night that they arrived. So um, I'm sure that must have been an exciting, interesting thing to see. Uh, there was a Colonel Shaw that accompanied them on their trip to Fort Klamath. Uh, I don't have any information on who this Colonel Shaw was. We haven't researched that. But an interesting note here is that uh, as they decided to get supplies here, they loaded up with five boxes of cigars, five bottles of brandy, five bottles of whiskey, three bottles of sherry. And why would they do that? to please the officers at Fort Klamath. So these were experienced travelers and they had encountered army officers uh, before. And so they, they knew that they needed to take uh, some, some supplies with them in order to, uh, you know, I don't wanna say bribe their way into uh, certain situations, but they, they knew how to work the system, I guess, let's put it uh, that way. So they've, um, acquired those supplies as well as uh, here uh, we see they're acquiring uh, blankets, uh, binocular telescope and an aneroid bar. And uh, now we're ready to head from San Francisco 
up to Fort Klamath. So at 8 a.m. on the September 23rd, this is now about two weeks before the execution of the Modocs. Uh, they board the railroad, they have lunch in Stockton, uh, they head for Reading. Uh, it's noted here that it was 102 degrees in the shade and uh, they were all demoralized by the heat. Uh, I say they were lucky to only have 102 degrees. Uh, I'm sure they would feel the effects of climate warming if they were to visit uh, California these days uh, during the summer months. Um, so the next day at 1 a.m., um, they uh, uh, are continuing their journey. Uh, they're on a, a stagecoach now and heading north out of Reading towards Wairika. Uh, they travel 115 miles in about uh, 12 hours. It's really uh, pretty remarkable. Um, so now they're in Wairika, uh, California, down in Siskiyou County. And uh, they've made arrangements to travel by private carriage from Wairika north towards uh, the Klamath Basin. Uh, they get off to a slow start. They drive through the Shasta Valley over uh, Goose Mountain and down to Butte Creek. This is in um, uh, Butte Valley, uh, Weed, uh, not Weed, but uh, McDowell and Doris area, just south of Klamath Falls here. And they arrive at Balls Ranch uh, just after sundown. Uh, it became very cold. Uh, they left 102 degree temperatures in the Central Valley, and now it's very cool in uh, Butte Valley. And the question is, where can we sleep? And Mr. Ball, their host said, I guess they can sleep in the hay in the barn, which they did. Now I've called up a map here just to make sure everybody has the lay of the land. I presume that many of you, if you're history buffs, uh, know this territory pretty well. But in the lower left-hand corner here, we see Wairika on the old uh, wagon road, the forerunner of uh, Highway 99. Um, the Southern Oregon wagon road uh, would have been in existence and in use at the time, but the railroad uh, ended in Redding and they traveled by stage to Wairika. So the most direct route on up to uh, Fort Klamath uh, here at the top of the map would have been to come up over Ball Mountain and down into Butte Valley here. So you can see McDowell. And this was uh, the area where they spent the night uh, in the hay, sleeping in the barn. Then uh, their travels would have continued on to Keno, where there is a ferry operated by Robert Whittle, and then on into Linkville at the time. And then they would have continued the trip on up into um, the Wood River Valley and Fort Klamath. Um, all right, so continuing now our, the account of the trip, they get ready to leave Butte Valley. They wake up in the morning and find out that their whiskey has been stolen. And so uh, they tried to be prepared for everything, but one thing that they apparently didn't prepare for was the possibility of being robbed uh, of their whiskey. And then they have to travel across 18 miles of what is described as damn desert. I, I'm gonna guess that described their uh, journey across Butte Valley. Uh, they had lunch at Miller's. Uh, I'm not clear on who Miller was, but we do know a little bit of the history of Bob Whittle's Ferry um, at what is now known as the town of Keno on Highway 66. Uh, Mr. Abbey wrote in his journal uh, that the ride from Keno into Linkville was a very pleasant ride, and uh, they had good quarters in Linkville provided by Mr. Nurse, uh, who was the founder of Linkville and operated a hotel on the banks of Link River. Uh, this is the earliest known photo we have of Linkville. It was taken by Peter Britt, um, who some of you will know much more about than I do. But apparently Mr. Britt made a journey to Klamath uh, to Linkville and took this photo in 1874. So this is the, what the scenery would have looked like when our gentleman from Cleveland arrived, just a plus, small cluster of buildings on the east bank of Link River. And uh, I believe this photo or this building here would have been the hotel uh, that Mr. Nurse operated and where Mr. Case and Mr. Abbey would have spent the night. On the particular night they arrived, they noted that uh, there was a brawl uh, in, um, in the tavern um, between a Donald McKay or Mackay 
uh, who was a figure of some note in the Modoc War. He served as a guide uh, for uh, the army. And uh, so this would have been a few months after the Modoc War and Mr. Mackay was, McKay was apparently hanging around Linkville still and um, leading a colorful life, uh, it sounds like. Now back to uh, Mr. Case's uh, journal. Uh, he reports that they traveled 36 miles and arrived at Fort Klamath uh, on the 28th of September, 1873. And so this is about a week now before uh, the scheduled execution. They are put up in the um, officer's quarters uh, and uh, have lodgings in the home of the officer of the day. And they get uh, outfitted with um, cots and uh, new blankets um, by the army. Um, Mr. Case then kept some very careful notes about the scene at Fort Klamath, and a lot of this was new information to us as we read these journals. Uh, this particular entry here is just a list of the officers that Mr. Case uh, made a note of, and as we go down the list, we see a lot of names that we recognize. General Frank Wheaton at one point was in charge of troops during the Modoc War. Uh, later, he was uh, replaced by another uh, general, uh, General Jefferson Davis. Um, but then uh, after the war, we see here that uh, Lieutenant General Frank Wheaton is in charge of Fort Klamath again. Uh, Henry McElderry was uh, a, a physician and uh, attended to a number of uh, soldiers injured during the war. Uh, Jocelyn and Kingsbury, I believe, was another physician. And so we recognize a lot of these names here from other records. Uh, that we had uh, from the Modoc War. And then this next page that I had to show you was really fascinating to us. Um, Mr. Case records a list of the Modoc uh, prisoners that are kept inside the guardhouse at Fort Klamath. And uh, of course, we recognize all the names on this list, but also he did us the service of uh, drawing a sketch of the interior of the guardhouse, showing where these two gentlemen, uh, Captain Jack is the Modoc on the right here. This is Kent Puash, the war chief leader of the Modoc people in the lava beds. And this is Sconchin John, a uh, photo taken by a Wairika photographer. Um, uh, and you see them here in leg irons after they've been uh, captured by the army. Uh, anyway, Mr. Case then drew a sketch of the guardhouse, which was divided into three rooms. And you can compare uh, here the list of Modoc prisoners with the numbers that are indicated on um, Mr. Case's drawing here. And we see prisoners numbers nine and 10 are in the center room. Uh, nine and 10 are Captain Jack and Sconchin John. So presumably this middle room, I'm gonna guess would have been the most secure uh, perhaps. Uh, and the two of them then were isolated and kept uh, together. So Kent Puash, Captain Jack and Sconchin John were the number one and two leaders um, of the, the uh, Modocs that were in the lava beds. Uh, then we see the rest of the prisoners numbered. Um, at the bottom of this uh, page, we see here a note, let me see, I think I yeah, can bring that up. Uh, outside the guardhouse, there is a stockade, um, uh, basically a fenced area where other Modocs uh, were confined. And Mr. Case lists here that there were 32 bucks, 55 squaws, 62 uh, children, making a total of 149 that were kept outside in the stockade. And then you add the 13 that were in leg irons, making a total of 162 Modocs that were captive uh, throughout the summer of 1873, uh, awaiting a trial and the sentencing of the six Modocs who were convicted uh, in the murders of General Canby and Reverend Thomas. Uh, referring back to the list here that Mr. Case made, he placed an asterisk next to the name of the six Modocs who were convicted in the murder trial. And so those are all listed here. Um, their names are um, Barncho, Slowlux, 
Boston Charlie, Black Jim, Captain Jack, who he writes his Modoc name here as Kinkapoos. Um, nowadays, we think the spelling of that would have been, or the sound of that would have been more like Kintquash. And then Sconchin, sometimes known as Sconchis or Sconchin John, would have been the sixth figure um, convicted in the murder. <clears throat> Now, continuing on with uh, the journal, we now are at about, uh, let's see, we're at about four days before the trial. And so uh, an officer at the fort introduced Mr. Case to some of the Modoc prisoners. And so they met Shack Nasty Jim, Steamboat Frank, William the Wild Girls Man, Hooka Jim, and Scarface Charlie. We have pictures of some of these uh, individuals. We have... Um, um, these four pictures of the Modoc men that were met by this guy, our millionaire tourist from Cleveland. Uh, what an amazing thing to think about that uh, of all the people in the country that had been reading about the Modoc war and following its account in newspapers across the country. Uh, this gentleman here from Cleveland had the wherewithal, the means to uh, pay for his own travel across the country to meet these four uh, individuals. Uh, what a meeting it must have been. Um, if you know your MODOK history, you'll probably know that uh, some of the individuals shown here of the MODOKs, um, they played a, a pretty dark role in uh, the MODOK War. On the opening day of the MODOK War in November of 1872, um, when a small band of soldiers went to try to capture Captain Jack, there was a pretty fierce reaction. And uh, this man here, third from left, Hook, Hooker Jim, sometimes he's referred to as Hooker Jim, uh, he led a group of Modocs that uh, reacted against the attack by the soldiers and uh, Oregon volunteers. Uh, this man, Hooker Jim, um, basically led an, a group of Modocs on a war path around the north shore of Tule Lake. And uh, that day, they killed 14 uh, settlers, uh, men and boys. They didn't harm any women, but they did kill 14 uh, settlers that day in retaliation for the attack, the Army's attack on their village near where the town of Merrill, Oregon is now. And... Um, so there was a considerable uh, lobbying on the part of local residents to have this man, Hooka Jim, prosecuted for those murders. Uh, but during the course of the war and towards the end of the war, as the army struggled to capture Captain Jack, uh, two men here, Hooka Jim and Shack Nasty Jim, uh, helped the army track down Captain Jack. And they basically then... Um, entered into a settlement agreement with the U.S. Army. And so they were not charged with any uh, crimes during the war. They got to live, um, although they were captive and confined to res a reservation in Oklahoma, they were able to live. Uh, as we look back on it now, there's a lot of folks that say Hooka Jim in particular is probably the, the one who is most culpable for violence during the Modoc War. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of a side note, uh, moving on with our, our journal here. Uh, what we'll see in the next few pages are some of the experiences that Mr. Case had uh, during his visit of a few days at Fort Klamath. On the 30th of September, uh, they basically went on a little tour. Um, Shaw, Taylor, and Fox uh, drove our turnout to Wood River. And then they went on uh, foot a mile and a quarter to the source of Fort Creek. It gushed out 20 feet wide and four or five feet deep. This Fort Creek that is mentioned here is the main water source that supplied um, the military fort. And it's still a well-known place. Uh, I say well-known, there's a lot of people that don't know this little spring exists, but it's, um, it's known as Reservation Spring and it still gushes out of the ground, a, a steady constant flow of cold, clear water um, that uh, supplied water to the fort. And it's a, it's a lovely place to visit. This is a picture that I took on a visit to the spring uh, several years ago. Uh, now it's October 1st, it's two days before the execution. Um, and so uh, Mr. Case was invited to go along with uh, Dr. Cabanis to visit the Modocs. 
And he notes here that uh, the doctor gave some opium to Captain Jack, who was probably suffering a considerable amount of anxiety. Um, someone in the party by the name of Henry bought uh, Mary's cap. I think this is Mary, uh, the uh, wife of Captain Jack. Scarface Charlie uh, brought me his hat, which he bought for $4 and took a bead thing and change $1. So doing a little uh, trading with the Modoc captives here, gathering some um, uh, some mementos, I guess. Um, let's see, let me see if I can back up and get that picture again. I just wanted to note here that Captain Jack is uh, written here as a CAP with a T in superscript and then uh, the name Jack. So it took a little bit of decoding to uh, figure some of these uh, journal pages out. Uh, now it is October 2nd, and it's the day before the execution. And uh, Mr. Case records in his, gener uh, his journal that uh, General Wheaton, the commander of the post, invited uh, Mr. Case and uh, presumably Mr. Abbey to be a witness to the interview between the chaplain and the general and the MODOK prisoners. And so there were 13 MODOK uh, men, uh, prisoners, on one side of the room and then um, the army representatives and our millionaire tourist from Cleveland, Ohio, Mr. Case, uh, sitting in the room in the Fort Klamath guardhouse to witness this discussion that's gonna take place. Uh, the chaplain made some comments and after um, that comment uh, was, after his talk was done, the sentence was made known to the prisoners, that is that six of them would be executed the others were led back to their cells, but the conversation continued. And now Captain Jack asks, uh, excuse me, General Wheaton asks a question of Captain Jack. Why did they commit the murders? What effect did they suppose it would have? And Captain Jack uh, offers a response. And I'm just gonna read this, you can uh, read with me. Captain Jack says, I was always for peace. In killing commissioners, that is uh, General Canby and uh, Reverend Thomas, in killing commissioners, you ask what expected to gain. Young men, not ready peace, but gave no reason. A great while ago, I gave advice to my people always for peace, but the young men killed citizens on Lost River. That would be the Hook a Jim party that I mentioned. The war went on but I was glad to have peace at any time. Now, uh, this is an interesting comment by Captain Jack because uh, people who have studied the Modoc War might read this differently that either Captain Jack was just pleading for his life here, or maybe he was making an honest case for his leadership in the years leading up to the Modoc War. Uh, and you know, different people are probably gonna read this different ways. Uh, certainly, there were times when Captain Jack uh, Kintpwash tried to find ways to make peace and settle issues with the United States Army. And I might point out that if you research the Modoc War, you will find that there were Army officers that wanted to make peace with the Modocs. In particular, there was one captain who pleaded with his superiors to, you know, let's just give these Modocs what they want. They just want a piece of land, a small piece of land that they can live on. Let's just let them have their land and let's call this whole thing off. Um, but uh, that was not to be and uh, the hostilities continued and it uh, then eventually resulted in that fateful day on the 11th of April in 1873 when Captain Jack, uh, coerced by his, uh, his leaders, uh, pulled out a gun and shot and killed General Canby. Uh, Captain Jack continues his comments here. He says, the troops killed my people that was all right, but they made my heart sick because determined on fighting. Uh, and then there's a pause and he continues. After I had surrendered and was taken to the fort, I had no idea of being punished for I know my heart was right. I thought to come and live at peace on Klamath Lake. Now, uh, I might just pause here for a second and say that one of the things we found about Mr. Case's journal entries is that much of it corroborated the information that we have from army records and newspaper accounts. But Mr. Case 
being this uh, uh, affluent and apparently fairly well-educated gentleman from Cleveland, Ohio, was able to record here details about Captain Jack's thoughts and his comments and the hours leading up to the execution that we had never uh, heard of before. And so these were chilling comments for us to read. Uh, an interpreter who was uh, serving that day says that Captain Jack is anxious to know if you, General Wheaton, could entertain the idea of his living. And General Wheaton's response was, tell Captain Jack that President Grant's orders will be carried out. Uh, Captain Jack responds. He says, I want the great chief at Washington to know there have been lies to him about Jack. I have always been friendly to white people. And in many ways, that was a true statement by Jack. He had worked, Captain Jack, he had worked for white people and traveled to Wairika and uh, had a lot of contact with white people. Uh, Captain Jack continues, perhaps if the great chief come here, he might change his opinion. And General Wheaton's response is, tell Captain Jack that the great chief has millions of people, he cannot see them all. You know, some of this reads like a bad Hollywood movie script here about the, uh, you know, the great chief and so forth. But these were actual words as recorded by Mr. Case on the day before the execution. Uh, let's see, I want to breeze through these comments because my time is running short here. But uh, Boston Charlie was also interviewed and he makes a bold statement saying, you all know me. During the whole war, it seemed to me that I had two hearts, one Indian heart and one white heart. I am a boy, yet you all know very well of what I am guilty. And he makes no apology here uh, as he continues uh, his comments. Um, he says, although I'm a boy, I feel that I am a man. And when I look at the others in this room, I see only women. When I die and go to the other world, I don't want them to go with me. I realize that I'm the only man in this room today. And then there was some comments lost and he concludes, I am all man, not half woman. So very bold comments there by Boston Charlie. But now it's the day of the execution. It's October 3rd, uh, Friday in 1873 at 8 a.m. Shaw, and Fox to the guardhouse and saw the news broken to Slowlux and Barncho. Uh, what news was this? It was the news that their sentences would be commuted. They would not be executed, uh, but these two men, Slowlux and Barncho, uh, were going to be uh, had their sentences commuted uh, to life imprisonment. I think the reason for that was that they didn't actively participate in the shooting, uh, but they had carried, as I understand it, they carried weapons uh, to the scene of the the murders. Uh, Mr. Case here describes what uh, the four condemned men were wearing. And we see here that Captain Jack was wearing dirty gray pants, a striped shirt, um, an undershirt, and had a bare head. And uh, the others were described as well. And then we had this very brief description of the execution. At 10.13 and 20 seconds, the arrangements were completed. And at 10.15 a.m., the drop fell. 30 minutes after the bodies were cut down and couriers started on their race. Uh, there were three newspaper reporters present to witness uh, the execution. The nearest telegraph was in Jacksonville. And so as soon as the execution had been carried out, uh, three uh, couriers uh, began their race with the news to get to the telegraph wire in Jacksonville. Uh, so that the news could be uh, communicated to the newspapers and published uh, as far back as New York. Um, and then there's this odd comment. Um, uh, just then, the interpreter told um, me, Leonard Case, that when he turned to leave them, Sconchus or Sconchin John said, I do not wish to die. When I look at my heart, I see that it is good. At the bottom of the step, heard him say, Boston Charlie says, he wants me to live and have Scarface Charlie die in my place. Uh, so you can imagine the wretched feelings of these four individuals uh, as they were facing their death on the gallows. And um, I'm sure a number of people will, will read different things into those comments. Uh, just to me, it, it's a pretty wretched piece of, uh, of business. 
Uh, Mr. Abbey, the assistant to Mr. Case, writes in his journal that the drop fell at 10.15 a.m. 30 minutes after they were cut down, put into boxes, and carried to a tent a short distance from the gallows in the edge of the timber, where I suppose their heads were cut off uh, to be sent to the Anatomical Museum at Washington. And we know that to be a fact that uh, all four corpses of the Modoc uh, leaders were uh, decapitated and their skulls uh, were shipped back to Washington, D.C., where they eventually ended up in the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, they were repatriated to a tribal member, as I recall, some 20 years ago. And so uh, the heads of the Modocs did come back to the Klamath Basin, although it's still unknown to us um, what was done with the heads. Uh, and so that's uh, still a mystery. So uh, these are some vivid uh, uh, details that we learned about the four men whose graves are still marked at the Fort Klamath Museum and still visited by thousands of people uh, every year. It's uh, been fascinating for us to, to learn these details. We're grateful to our museum patrons and supporters who helped us raise the $20,000 and some change that we needed uh, in order to buy these journals and bring them back to Klamath. Um, a, a few years ago, we replaced the markers on the Modoc graves, and we were happy to partner with uh, some local vendors, a local sawyer who sawed us some juniper planks, and uh, a local uh, a trophy store that did the engraving for us. And we partnered with members of the Klamath tribes and Modoc descendants to place new markers at the graves and uh, hope that these new markers will last uh, for a very long time. 